Uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's coronavirus briefing. I'm here with Sarah Albon, the Chief Executive of the Health and Safety Executive. Um, today I'd like to update you on our continuing work to reopen our country's economy. And I know that this matters uh, greatly to everyone. But before I do so, uh, I want to take you through the latest daily coronavirus data slides. Uh, could we have the first slide, please? The first slide shows cases confirmed with a test. 5,870,506 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out or posted in the UK. This includes 102,930 tests carried out or posted yesterday. 289,140 people have tested positive, an increase of 1,387 cases since yesterday. The graph shows a steadily falling number of identified cases on a seven-day rolling average, despite the increase in testing. Can we have the, uh, the second slide, please? The second slide shows the latest data from hospitals. 446 people were admitted to hospital with coronavirus in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland on the 6th of June, down from 624 a week ago, and down from a peak of 3,431 on the 1st of April. 513 coronavirus patients are currently in mechanical ventilation beds in the UK, down from 653 a week ago, and down from a peak of 3,301 on the 12th of April. The third slide, please. The third slide shows what is happening in hospitals across the country. There are now 6,348 people in hospitals with coronavirus in the UK, down 17% from 7,622 7, a week ago and down from a peak of 20,698 on the 12th of April. As the graphs show, whilst there is some variation, most nations and regions of the UK are broadly following a similar pattern. A fourth slide, please. The fourth slide shows the daily figures for those who have sadly lost their lives after testing positive for coronavirus. Across all settings, the total number of deaths now stands at 40,883. That's an increase of 286 fatalities since yesterday. When measured by a seven-day rolling average, the daily number of deaths currently stands at 216, down from a peak of 943 on the 14th of April. And the fifth slide, please. The fifth slide shows the deaths where coronavirus was confirmed or suspected reported by the Office for National Statistics. These figures take slightly longer to compile than the daily figures as they're drawn from death certificates. They include not just deaths confirmed with a positive test for COVID-19, but also those confirmed by a doctor without a test and those where COVID-19 was suspected but not confirmed. The first chart shows that up to the 29th of May, the ONS reported a total of 50,107 deaths in the UK where COVID-19 was mentioned on the death certificate. This compares to the figure of 38,593 deaths confirmed with a positive test previously reported by the Department of Health and Social Care over the same period. The second chart shows deaths by place of occurrence. Since the start of the outbreak, 62% of registered COVID-19 deaths have occurred in hospitals and 31% have occurred in care homes. At the start of this crisis, we took the necessary steps of closing vast numbers of shops, all but those we regarded as essential to try and stop the spread of coronavirus and protect the public. That was the right decision. Even though there is no escaping the hardships it will, of course, for businesses and their staff. To support those workers and businesses, we put in place an unprecedented package of support, including small business grants, loans, the job retention scheme, and the self-employed scheme. Now, thanks to the efforts of the British people in following social distancing rules, we have succeeded in reducing the number of infections and getting the R rate under control. That is why we can carefully begin to open parts of the economy which were required to be closed in a phased and careful manner. On the 1st of June, 
we allowed car showrooms and outdoor markets to open. Thanks to the ongoing enormous efforts of people across the country, we continue to meet the five tests set out in the Prime Minister's roadmap. And the R rate continues to stay below one. So I can confirm today that retail outlets, which have been required to be closed, will be able to open their doors again from Monday, the 15th of June, so long as they comply with the COVID secure guidelines we published on the 25th of May. This is the latest step in the careful restarting of our economy and will enable high streets up and down the country to spring back to life. Of course, many shops have remained open throughout the pandemic, ensuring that we're able to buy the essentials we need. And I would like to thank those workers at supermarkets, at pharmacies, at post offices, and other essential retailers for their dedication during this period. Many of these businesses rapidly adapted to introduce social distancing early on, including special opening hours for vulnerable people, perspex screens at checkouts, floor markings to guide shoppers, and limiting the number of customers allowed inside a store at one time. In the new normal, we have all got used to shopping with social distancing. Now is the right time to apply these principles more widely to more shops as we continue our cautious reopening of the economy. To support this, on the 25th of May, my department published updated COVID secure, safer working guidance for people uh, who work in or run shops or branches in the retail sector. This has given retail businesses enough time to make sure their premises are COVID secure. And this will allow workers to return safely back to stores and welcome back shoppers on Monday. This guidance was developed in close consultation with both national and independent retailers, business representative groups, trade unions, Public Health England, and the Health and Safety Executive. Shops should reopen once they're able to follow the COVID-19 secure guidelines, giving confidence to both the staff and customers that they are opening safely. This means any business that is open must complete a COVID-19 specific risk assessment and take the necessary steps to manage those risks as is their legal obligation. As part of the guidance, we have provided a notice that businesses should visibly display in their shop window or outside their door to show their customers they have read and taken steps to follow the guidance. If a shop reopens without putting in place responsible steps to reduce the transmission of the virus, we can take a range of actions, including issuing enforcement notices. Local authorities and the health and safety executive regularly carry out checks and respond to concerns from the public regarding risks in the workplace. But of course, there are businesses which still remain closed. As soon as we can, we will publish further safer working guidance for restaurants, pubs and bars, as well as hairdressers, barbers, nail bars and related services. These documents will provide practical steps to allow those businesses to reopen in a manner that is as safe as possible for workers and their customers. I know there's been a lot of speculation about when we might be able to reopen these parts of the economy, and I completely understand why we're all so keen to get them back up and running, and I absolutely share that enthusiasm. But we continue to follow the roadmap, which sets out our ambition to reopen these sectors from the 4th of July at the earliest. In the meantime, we will continue to protect livelihoods and support businesses so that they're ready to bounce back and play their part in the economic recovery. And as we consider measures needed to support our economic bounce back, we will be redoubling our efforts to listen to and work with the business community. We want to build an economy which is fairer, greener, more dynamic, more innovative, and which attracts investment from all over the world. So starting this week, I am leading five new recovery roundtables, bringing together businesses and business representative groups and leading academics. They will consider measures to support economic recovery and ensure we have the right skills and opportunities in place for our workforce. These sessions will feed directly into the government's work on economic recovery and we will help deliver the commitments we made 
for the British people only last December. These now take on an even greater sense of urgency and importance. Because whilst we have a laser-like focus on the immediate public health challenge in front of us, we recognise our debt to businesses which have played such a vital role in combating coronavirus and keeping our economy moving. And we will work shoulder to shoulder with our businesses as we get ready for our economic fight back. Right, we'll now um, move to questions uh, from the public. So can we have the first question from uh, Alison from London? At the moment, people can go on day trips to exercise or meet family following social distancing rules. But when can people and families book UK holidays and stay overnight? For example, self-catering camping and cottage hire. Uh, Alison, uh, thank you for your question. And um, I, I do understand uh, why people want to have answered those questions. Uh, but what I've said and what the government has said all along is that we want to do an opening up the economy in a, in a phased uh, manner, in a careful manner, and that's what we have done uh, on the 1st of June. Uh, we, uh, we reopened uh, parts of, of the, the economy. Uh, we are now saying for uh, other retail, uh, they will be open to, able to open from the 15th of June. But of course, it's really important that we continue to support uh, the sort of businesses that Alison has talked about. So we have the furlough scheme in place, uh, we have the grant scheme in place, and we will continue to support our businesses. Uh, the next question is a written question from Hansi from uh, Manchester. Uh, Hansi. There have understandably been various government support packages for existing businesses during the UK lockdown. As we start to ease out of lockdown, the economic recovery is going to be vital in helping life return to normal. With this in mind, Will the government commit to supporting new, innovative startups in the coming months? Uh, Hansi, thank you for that. That's uh, uh, a, uh, a, a very good question. Uh, as you will know, the, uh, the Chancellor announced uh, a £1.25 billion package, uh, and as part of that, uh, we also had the, the Future Fund, uh, and we will be making further announcements in terms of how we get the economy going in terms of these uh, green, innovative firms. And as I said, I'm going to be uh, uh, leading uh, a, a set of conversations with business, with academics, uh, uh, over the next few days, over the next few weeks, uh, and we want to get precisely those answers because we do want a dynamic economy, a green economy, and we want to make sure that it is also inclusive. Uh, I think we now move to questions from the uh, media. So the first question is from Vicky Young at the BBC. Uh, Vicky. Mr Sharma, many businesses, including pubs and restaurants, say that the two metre rule means that it is impossible for them to make a profit. Now, the World Health Organisation recommends one metre. Have you been arguing for that to change? Uh, well, Vicky, I, I, uh, what I would say to you is that um, uh, the two metre rule is currently in place. We, of course, take advice from uh, our scientists, from, from SAGE. Uh, and, uh, of course, um, you know, when it is safe to do so, uh, we will see whether you can move to a, a shorter distance. Uh, but, ultimately, we keep all of these things under review. Um, you know, you've made the point um, uh, that there are um, you know, other countries in the world that have moved uh, from two metres to uh, closer distances. Uh, of course, they are... Uh, 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 further along in terms of um, their roadmap, uh, in terms of opening up businesses. But as I said, we keep these matters under review. So how soon could that happen, in your opinion? Well, I, I can't answer that uh, a question. Uh, what we are doing is opening up the economy in a really sort of phased manner. I think that's the right approach. We're taking a, a cautious view on this because, frankly, the last thing we want, and I, you know, I have conversations on a daily basis with businesses, Vicky, and um, what they all recognise is the worst possible thing that could happen is that uh, we have a second peak, uh, we lose all the gains that we have got so far, uh, and uh, that would set back confidence uh, in the country, but also uh, in the business community as well. We don't want that to happen, but I completely understand uh, why, for economic reasons, uh, businesses will want uh, to, to have a look at this two-metre rule. As I said, with all of these matters, we keep this under review. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Can we move to uh, Joel Hills from ITV? Uh, yeah, good afternoon, uh, Minister. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm going to continue the same theme, uh, and I want to go one further, Minister, because you actually promised a review on the social distancing rule in good time, the Prime Minister said, for the reopening of shops on the 15th of June. So what is the result of that review? 
will it be reduced? Uh, well, Joel, as I said, um, we are at two metres. Uh, the two metres stays in place for the moment. Uh, but, uh, you know, as I've also made very clear, the Prime Minister's made clear, we keep all of these things under review. Uh, and I do get uh, why uh, businesses uh, in, uh, in a whole range of sectors uh, make the economic case uh, why you would want to move closer than, than two metres. But ultimately, this is about what is safe. And I said, uh, you know, we will keep this under review and we will only make changes when it is safe to do so. So a follow on. The case, Minister, because they don't understand the rationale of two metres in the UK. Uh, it's one and a half metres in Germany, a country which has done rather well at getting on top of this virus. Uh, the World Health Organization rules are one metre. Um, pubs and restaurants are warning that they will be barely profitable at one metre social distancing. At two metres, a million jobs will be lost, Minister. Has government privately decided that actually job losses on that sort of scale are unfortunately inevitable? And if you have, would it not be advisable to say so publicly? Well, uh, Joel, as I said, um, you know, we do keep uh, this uh, issue under review and um, we will continue to do so. Uh, and I said we will only change it when we think it is safe to do so. Uh, you know, uh, ultimately, uh, this is... Sorry, I don't know whether Joel is asking a question or... Oh, I, I want to come in because you yes, promised an outcome, or you promised an outcome by the 15th of June. The Prime Minister gave that undertaking at the Liaison uh, Committee a couple of weeks back. So where is the outcome of the review? What has the government decided? And can you explain your reasoning, please? Yes, well, uh, let me explain the reasoning. So as I said, we, we, are, we are keeping this matter under review. Uh, and, and frankly, you know, I, can, I completely understand the commercial rationale, uh, rationale for this. I mean, as business secretary, you know, these are conversations that I have on a daily basis with, with businesses. Uh, but this is about uh, keeping people safe. And, and you talked about, uh, you know, support uh, for businesses. There is a huge range of support that we have made available for businesses. Uh, you know, if you compare on an international basis, uh, it's really incredibly favourable. I understand that, Minister. Can I for, uh, just well, ask one last question? Yes, it's of course. Not, you're not going to be publishing the advice in good time for the 15th of June. So can you now commit to us and give us another deadline? When will the government publish its review of the two-metre social distancing rule? You've also promised to publish the advice. It hasn't yet been published. When will it be published? Uh, what I will give you a commitment is that we will keep this under review and it will only change when it is safe to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Victoria MacDonald at uh, Channel 4. Victoria. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. On an entirely different subject, last week a report from Public Health England was published which we hoped would shed some light onto why people from Black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds seem to be disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Part of that report was missing. This was the community engagement section, which had had thousands of contributions. And we've spoken to some of those contributors who are actually dismayed that it hasn't been published. So can you tell me why was this missing? Who decided not to publish it? And can you guarantee that this section of this report will be published? Uh, well, Victoria, I, I think the, the report uh, was published, it was comprehensive, uh, it had a, a set of conclusions in it, and one of the conclusions uh, in terms of the, the, the disparities issue uh, was around uh, uh, people from black and Asian minority ethnic groups uh, are at higher risk uh, than, than white groups. It also made the point that actually uh, the key determinant of risk is age, uh, so it did say that um, uh, you know, if you are uh, 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 over 80, 80 or over, you're 70 times more likely uh, to be at risk than someone under 40. Uh, it also made the point that um, uh, men are two times at uh, higher risk uh, than, than women, and it made uh, a, uh, a sort of commentary on the fact that uh, those who are in live in deprived areas, uh, unfortunately, are at higher risk as well. It also went on to talk about comorbidities as well. Um, so it was a pretty comprehensive report, and as you know, uh, the Equalities Minister, Kemi Badenoch, is going to be taking this work forward. Uh, the terms of reference of that work have been published, uh, and of course, we will look at any policy changes that, uh, that come out of this. Can, can I just on? Say, yeah. Mr. Sharma, we, we, most of that was already known, so the, the bit I was specifically referring to was the community engagement 
part of this, which was, we were led to believe, led by Professor Kevin Fenton. And that's the bit that is missing, and that is the bit that is, has dismayed the many contributors. Uh, well, uh, what I say, I think the report is is very comprehensive, and uh, there is work which is being taken forward by Kemi uh, Badenoch. Uh, in a follow up to this, uh, you know, the terms of reference are are, are available; they're, they're they're public. And of course, I think the key thing here is to make sure that uh, where we learn that there are changes that need to be made in terms of policy, then of course we will look to do that. Thank you very much for that, Victoria. Uh, Francis Elliott from the Times. Francis, Business Secretary. Um, you gave non-essential shops three weeks notice uh, from the COVID secure guidelines. Can you commit to giving um, restaurants and other hospitality sectors at least three weeks notice, which I think pushes up pretty much imminently for the July the 4th uh, deadline. Uh, and secondly, Professor Chris Whitty said last week that the two meter rule would stay until the end of the epidemic. That's what he said last week, was he wrong? Uh, and you've said repeatedly that um, you, you, you will lift it when it's safe. Is that a question of numbers of infections or the R number? Which? Um, so I think in terms of publication, I, I can tell you that we are having a uh, consultation right now in terms of this, this further safer working guidance. Uh, that work is, is ongoing. Uh, and uh, you know, we will make sure that we publish it uh, ahead of time. It is important for business to be able to prepare. I completely understand that. Uh, in terms of the R factor, I go back to the question uh, the answers I gave earlier, which is that we will continue to keep this under review, and of course, uh, uh, this will depend on, on safety considerations. Uh, as as uh, sorry, not the R factor, the, um, uh, the 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 distance, the two meter distance, and we will of course um, uh, keep this under review, and uh, we will only make changes if it's safe to do so. Is there a follow up? Yeah, there, there is, I'm afraid, uh, Mr. Sharma, because people will really want to know against which metrics you're going to make that judgment. Um, just saying when it's safe to do so is in tension with the chief medical officer who says he wants it until the very end of the epidemic. Uh, ultimately, this is a political decision. Is that right? And against what metrics will you make that decision? Uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, Sarah if she wants to, to uh, come in on this as well. Uh, the, the one thing I would say is that if you look at uh, what uh, other jurisdictions, other countries have done, uh, they have looked to see what has happened in terms of infection rates. Uh, they've looked to see, uh, you know, uh, how uh, uh, you know those particular issues are, are moving before they have made those decisions. As I said, you know we will continue to look at those five tests. We will continue to look at R, uh, and those from from our perspective will be key determinants. Sarah. So um, I've been privileged to work quite closely with colleagues in Public Health England as they're developing the guidance and looking at these kind of issues and talking indeed to my own chief scientific advisor. And I think it's really very much as um, Minister Sharma said there, what, um, what you need to take into account, the science is very clear that where somebody has a COVID infection, the, the chance of them passing that on at two metres distance from other people is significantly less than, say, one and a half or one metre. So it requires um, a view both of the, the chance of the infection being passed on, but also the prevalence in society because that, that sort of mix of how many people in the population have got this illness, combined with what's a safe distance, gives you the probability of something being passed on. And it's, it's that complicated sort of series of um, considerations that will cause the, the scientists to give advice to government about the time when it's, it's safe to make a shift. If I, if I may uh, just add one other point on this, Francis, the fact that if you look at the workplace guidance that we've put out, um, we, we address the whole issue around uh, uh, two metres in distance, and of course we also say that uh, it is safer to work side by side uh, than it is uh, you know, facing each other, uh, and there's a range of these other measures that we have uh, recommended in our guidelines in terms of safer working. So do you have a follow-up? Could, could, could we have kind of restaurants where you eat side by side? I mean, is that the sort of thing that you can do? And, and I mean, I, I, is there a specific... Um, infection level uh, below which the probability is now acceptable. I mean, there must be, a, against, since that sum, that calculation can be made, you must already know what an infection rate needs to get down to before you can uh, unlock 
Yeah. Uh, well, look, uh, I think in terms of the, the guidance of how people conduct themselves in, in restaurants and pubs, uh, that is something that we will publish. And once it's published, uh, I'm very happy to sort of come back and, 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 uh, and go through that with you. Um, uh, in terms of um, the, the issue around the two-meter rule, I just want to say once again, I think we're going to keep this under review. Uh, and uh, only when it is safe uh, will it change. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Joe Mays at uh, Bloomberg. Joe. Business Secretary, um, in light of the pandemic, many of your Conservative colleagues are worried about the extent of China's involvement in critical infrastructure, including telecoms and nuclear power, and how that involvement might grow. So will the government's national security and investment bill address their concerns? And do you promise to introduce that legislation before the summer recess? Um, well, we, uh, we of course have the Enterprise Act currently that we can draw, draw upon in terms of uh, calling in, in uh, mergers and acquisitions. Um, we are committed to the NSNI bill that was set out in the Queen's speech. Uh, I am not going to give you a, a sort of a timetable on any of that, but all I would say is that we are absolutely committed to bringing that in. So, if I follow up, if I may, mm. will you make it harder for Chinese companies to invest in key UK assets? Uh, well, uh, look, I mean, uh, so, uh, what I'm not going to do is to preempt uh, what may or may not be in a uh, forthcoming bill. Uh, what I would say to you is that I think uh, it's important that uh, we uh, protect uh, our uh, um, you know, critical assets. Uh, that is what we do through the uh, Enterprise Act currently. And, of course, we will look to see uh, through uh, the, the forthcoming uh, bill when it comes through uh, how we might improve upon that. Thank you very much for that, Joe. Uh, the last question is from... Laura at the Sunderland Echo. Laura. Hello. Um, first question is, are the local sort of town by town, city by city R rates being calculated? Um, will those be used to determine any local lockdowns and will they be published at all? Um, and secondly, as businesses and local governments look towards economic recovery, what sort of support packages could places like Sunderland that has high levels of deprivation and have experienced high infection rates, um, a large number of deaths and a big leap in unemployment. What sort of um, support packages can they expect to see from central government? Uh, yeah, thank you uh, very much for that question, Laura. So, uh, look, what I, the, the first thing I'd say is that uh, we have Test and Trace up and running. Uh, we've got the Joint Biosecurity Centre, uh, which will help to contribute in terms of um, you know, identifying uh, any local areas where there are flare-ups. And, of course, we're already able to do that. You will see the action that we have taken in, in uh, Western Supermare. Um, so, but right now, given where the R, R rate is, uh, we are taking a, a countrywide approach, a, a national approach to this, and we will continue to do that uh, until uh, much more detailed information is uh, available. And in terms of support packages, uh, you know, uh, as, in, as in Sunderland, uh, uh, as in elsewhere, we have provided support uh, in terms of bounce back loans, um, over 21 billion pounds uh, has now been approved on that. We provided support in terms of you know, almost 9 million people across the country, uh, including people in, in Sunderland who will have been supported through the furlough scheme and, of course, uh, the self-employment scheme as well and a range of other measures that we have put in place. Uh, and we will continue to do that. And I said, you know, I'm starting these, uh, these very detailed conversations with uh, businesses uh, and academics and business representative groups to see how we can actually have a uh, innovative uh, economy across our country, you will know that one of the, the key themes of the general election and what the Prime Minister is absolutely uh, keen to make sure we do, which is level up, level up across our country, uh, level up in regions and in communities, and that is what we will do uh, over the coming years. Did you have a follow-up? Yeah, just I suppose as part of this levelling up, will that mean that there will be additional support for areas which have been more harder hit? Um, well, look, I mean, I, I think what I don't want to do is to preempt uh, anything that uh, uh, may come from the, the Chancellor in the, in, in the future or the Prime Minister in the future. What I would say to you is that we are absolutely committed in terms of the levelling up agenda. That is absolutely what uh, we want to make sure happens. And as part of the conversations that I have uh, over the coming days and weeks, uh, clearly levelling up is going to be one of the key themes. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Laura. Uh, that brings us to the end of this press conference. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, joining us. Uh, and um, uh, as uh, uh, we say, we want to make sure that people continue to uh, uh, stay alert and stay safe. Uh, we have now announced that uh, from Monday, we're going to be opening up uh, 
further parts of their economy. We're doing this in a gradual way, and we will continue to do that so we continue to stay safe, we meet our five tests, and we keep the R rate down. Thank you for your help.